right, let's see, am I still screen sharing? Screen sharing, I just lost the highlight. Well, welcome everybody. So we're gonna kick this off a little bit early in a little bit different way. It's gonna be a little loose and mostly hackathon style as best I can manage. I'm gonna be sitting here at my computer and my hearing is not fantastic. So you may have to come up and shout and figure out if I have a good ear or not. Um, hopefully you've got your laptops and you can uh, play along. Um, not sure how well this is gonna work hybrid. I think the hybrid people, the people at virtual are gonna have an advantage this time. Uh, being a little bit closer to computer. Um, have you guys found the UTD guest network? Uh, if you find that guest network, um, you can get it to send you a text so that you can activate, so you can get internet access here free. Um, it, as long as you can get to that, um, that free open initial web page. On my laptop here, it's taken me up to 45 minutes to get to where it would actually show me that page so I could get connected. Uh, but it's been going faster the last couple of times I've tried it. Right. So getting started, I went into a trailhead. I opened up a task. And I thought task is a fun object type because it has this related to field. There's not a whole lot of objects that are allowed to have um, a reference field that can point to other more than one object. You can point a task to an account, a cat task to a case. Uh, when you go in and edit, um, it should give you that option. I will find that. Uh, but that is unusual. So if we wanted to do something with that, and it was very hard, I love flows. I think you can do anything in, with flows, almost everything without code. Uh, I wanted to learn invocable Apex and kind of share that, but it's really hard because I don't know that there's a whole lot that I can't figure out how to do inside of flows that I would need Apex for. So my, uh, my mock um, example here is to do a get describe function. If we give a flow an object ID, any object ID from Salesforce, to be able to figure out what object type that object ID is, that's not something I think you can do very easily inside a flow with a regular query. I don't think there's an, an object somewhere that you can go query and say what record type, what object type does it belong to? In Apex, you can. There's a get describe function. So if you give it an ID, you can get back the name, whether it's an account or whether it's a uh, case um, or any other object. You can pull that back and it'll return that to you. So if we could return that to the flow, the flow could use that answer and say, okay, I'm doing something on a task, but if it's a task on account, then I need to do something different than I need to do if it's a case or if it's an opportunity. So we can make our, um, our flows kind of polymorphic. You could call them from any page or you could have them act on whatever, um, whatever object was entered. Again, this is kind of a weak case, a use case for this. There's some other interesting things. Did you have a comment or? No, okay. Um, I always wanted, I wanted to try and find uh, select distinct. Uh, but I couldn't get that figured out in time for the conference. That was That's one query that I'm usually wanting to do from flows. I just want to get back the unique um, record entries inside of a list of records. Um, I believe there's a way to do that uh, with Apex, but I wasn't able to get that figured out in time. So if we get, if this is too easy, we may move on to that. That'll probably involve a, a decent amount of Googling. So hopefully that's fun for everybody. Hey, Nathan. And welcome, Rohan. 
Hello. Is this your first time joining the group? Nope. I joined before, but then I I actually moved to a different place, then couldn't join a uh, couple, couple more, I guess, this year. So yeah, I saw, as soon as I saw this email, I immediately um, did my, um, I mean, I wanted to join this uh, this one. I didn't didn't want to miss this one. So, so yeah. Great. Thanks. Welcome. Thank you. Mr. Shulman, did we lose you? Did you go get a drink? Yes, he's gone. That's my buddy, Nate. Okay, so uh, created a new flow. I don't need that screen open anymore. Enter something. And this may be hard to do with that open. Testing. Hey, there you are. Yeah, I, my mic was not cooperating. But is this the happy hour? Well, we're gonna we're gonna freeform it a little bit. So this is I'm just kind of uh, getting started. So no real announcements today. Uh, no newsworthy news, and I figure we would just start in uh, getting this set up and getting some of the initial things early. So. If you're here early, all right, so we've got four people here. I do have swag to give away for, uh, let's see, and who was, did you guys register? Okay. Uh, do you have a sales blazer hoodie? All right, uh, let's see. Where's my coin? Keep a coin? All right, who can see? Odd, Umar, odd or even? Odd or even? First people to arrive get, get the swag. So these are brand new, I had not seen these before. Uh, and this is, I think it's a large. So if that doesn't work, I have extra large and two extra large, but yeah, this is extra large. I think I have two X and three X. <laughs> so congratulations, you may have to stay and uh, let me take a picture at the end, but Salesforce has been nice enough to give us a, uh, some swag to give away. So thank you for being the first attendee. Cool, all right. Can you show the, the camera? I didn't get to, it's a new sales blazer hoodie. Yeah, please. That's cool. Huh? How, I wish I had one. I thought you both got here at the same time, but I only had one to give away. I, yeah, that's cool. You guys can trade it back in here. Cool. All right. But yeah, we're gonna try and do that. I, th I think I've got enough swag now to give give something away. Something I, I only get the nice stuff. I'm not getting stickers or anything like that. But whoever gets here first uh, is probably gonna win it. All right. So here's a little flow. Simple display. Welcome. Finish. Done. Save, and then here is my apex action. Just stop when I was talking. All right, so the outline for this seems really basic. Um, and Nathan, you may have to help in here if I get too deep in the uh, uh, in dev and start talking uh, outside of my strength. Uh, but 
for each invocable to to create an invocable method and have it show up in uh, Lightning. This is pretty much the key element here. So you create a class in each invocable method. Uh, a class can only have one invocable function. That invocable function, whatever description you get it, give it, will show up in your flow as an option. So let me show you what I did there. So if you saw, I gave it a category of hello world, description, something we could not do yesterday, and the label of DDUG action, that's us. So in here, when we call, when we add a new action element to the flow, there's a new category called hello world. Inside of that category, there's exactly one action. And then we can give that a label. Please give these good labels of what they do and if they are referencing uh, Apex so that it is easy to find them. They are not great. This is all you get, DDUG action. The linkage between the flow and that Apex code, that's it. You have to go into the Apex code and find any Apex code that lists this word in order to be able to backtrack it. So if you don't give this a good description and you don't give the action a good description, it can take a long time uh, to find the, co the code that your flow is calling. So the next person who comes along will not like you if you give it an odd name and make it hard to find uh, and don't describe it. Because there's a lot of default actions, not all of them are apex actions. Uh, so a lot of people just leave them in unclassified, they don't even put that there, and that has not been fun. So this is the core method here that is gonna show up and do what we want to do. Invocable variables instantiated uh, here, and the output variable instantiated here. You are allowed to pass a list or a list of lists to an invocable apex action. Uh, and then as input parameters. So we can pass that in. So hopefully our record ID is coming in as part of this uh, flow input. And it should be a single element, although this invocable variable looks like it is not a list. It looks like it's just an ID. I may be incorrect. It may be list or list of lists or output only. What you I'll tell you what I remember. Well, I, I made one of these once. And what I remember is that even though, so, so record ID, I don't remember, but it, may, it would make sense if it's just one value. But I do remember, even though it looks like you're passing one value as a parameter, it always expects a list and it always returns a list. Even if it's like one value in and one value out, it always has to be a list, right? Something okay. like that. Yeah, that sounds right. I'm just trying to figure out if I can see where that would, yeah. So it's it's treating the flow input as a list. Um, cool. Well, let's see how this works. All right, so what we wanna do, let's go back to my org. And let's find the ID of an opportunity. Okay, we'll go up here and steal this from the URL. our current, current flow. And you can see I've just done this a few minutes before everybody got here, started setting this up. I have not done anything else to it. So we are going to barrel through this and learn it together. Anybody need time to catch up? Anybody doing this side by side or okay just watching Riding Shotgun? Let's 
let me know. I can copy and paste the code into the chat or uh, distribute it if you want. Okay. Looks like it returned our object name as opportunity to the outputs. So if we wanted to build, let's go build our flow and let it do something. So let's have a decision. Conditions are met and put object, object name equals Oh, I found out what I was talking about. Okay. Um, there can be at most one input parameter and its data type must be one of the following, a list of a prim primitive data type, a list of an S object, a list of user defined type. So it's saying all lists, but it seems to work fine with a single record ID, right? Yeah, I, th I think, I, and I, I copied and pasted this code from some uh, stack exchange that. Uh, okay. So I, I got a little bit of a kickstart, a head start, a lot of a head start actually. Um, I think the list has to do with bulkification. Okay, so default outcome or this outcome. Okay, so it took us to our opportunity screen. Let's run it again. 
Let's go find something else. Now, of course, we're smart and everybody knows that the first three characters are kind of a cheat code for which object type it is. So 001, that's an account. Let's see if the flow agrees with us. It does not. Object name account. Why didn't it hit my default? I feel like maybe, do I have something open? Yeah, I was running the wrong version. Okay. So we've used Apex and pulled Apex code into flows. Easy peasy. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I appreciate it. <laughs> what else cool can we do? So we know it's an account. We have one uh, variable there. Uh, what if we wanted to pull something else out? So let's cram this into here. We return results. The results are add new flow output record. So looks like we're just stuffing this data into this array. So if we wanna add something else to results here, we could add it. So it's for flow and for params. All right, so let's be fancy. So I don't know where params, params is coming from the input. Yeah, we could just add it down here. We could do a results. Dot add. All right, that should do something. Let's see how easy it is to just start writing bad code. Oh, doesn't like it. Oh, because I still use quotes because I'm not an Apex developer. At least not a good one. Okay, so it doesn't like, why doesn't it like string add here? It has to be a new flow output. I have an idea for you. You could have an object guessing game. So, so like I, I figured out what's going on. What what I was saying about the list. You have the list on line eight. So you take an input list and you have an output list. So I was reading about it, getting a refresher, and. The input array has to match the output array. So that's like the bulkification thing. But if you go to your flow input class, you could add another variable that would be like invocable variable, public string, object guess. You see what I'm saying here? So I like, do not. so you can have this list of flow input is, is an object. You only have one property, which is the record ID. You can add a second property. So what I'm proposing is you have a string called object guess. So like you could paste in an ID and you could type an account and then you're playing a matching game and then it will tell you this isn't an account or something like that. But the exercise there is to have multiple values and a parameter in addition to just the record ID. Okay. It doesn't, I mean, it, it can be anything, but you, you can add more parameters under line four and then it should show up in the flow. I could add more parameters under line four. Oh, okay. Well, why can't I add more elements to the results object? So it's below that on line 20. Oh. So scroll down to line 20, that's your flow output class. So you could make another invocable variable below that, that would be like, um, you know, let's say string 
something else. So, so like copy line 21, paste it below 21. That's where you can have your second output value. And, and let's say this is just called message. I, I, know, I see what you're trying to do now. And I'll, yeah, ex, O extra two. Okay. Now you have to change line 23, which is your constructor. So you have string object name comma. So, so you, have a, you need to make another parameter. You can just let me drive. Yeah, I, I'm perfectly willing to do that. How do I do? How do I do this? Request keyboard. Yep. Says you raised hand. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll lower it. I, I don't see like right click and uh, ah request remote control. Here we go. So I'll I'll explain rather than just type it, but. What, what you need here is, this is like really crammed together. You've got a constructor and parameters on, on a class. So I, I can't do anything. It's gonna still. fix the indenting first thing. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm not sure I can do anything. Oh, wait, something's happening, right? This is windowed, so. Okay, so, so just think of it like, okay, I got it. So you, now you have two properties. You have the name of the object and then extra string two. And then below it is a constructor, which, which is getting called up here. I mean, this is, this is like a lot of stuff happening together. And then I would, probably super laggy too. Wait for it. Okay, so let's make this look normal. Okay, so the first thing you do, you're setting the object. Now. I, I mean, this is probably not the the yeah. most normal way to do this but do it do it the quickest it. way possible that'll be more clear don't spend a whole lot of time on the formatting oh. or else the formatting becomes a lesson not the yeah we're going to do like follow the pattern Okay. So now you have that. I'm going to just comment this out. So, so right here, you are instantiating a flow output object from this class. The first parameter you're passing in is, this is the name based on the record ID that you got. And now we need a comma here. Mm -hmm. And then uh, say, uh, trying to think of something funny, but Paul is a <laughs> Okay, so this will be the message. Now, if that doesn't complain, do we still have a problem here? Yeah, it's constructor. Results dot add new flow output get name. And then this should be the second. Oh, it's flow output. I'm kind of curious why this is blue and this is a different color hello hey hi nathan line number 
thirteen. I have to get name the close brace. Remove one. Oh. From there. Remove that and make it after the ball. It says fifty. Yeah, before awesome. songs. Sorry, it's. Thank you. No, you need one more. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Let's see if it compiles. If it's happy. So, okay. so yeah, this can become two again. Yeah, that wasn't the problem. Okay. Pair programming. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now run it or save that and run it, and I'll stop typing. And I'll stop talking. Cool. Okay, we're saved. Now, how do we access that when we get into the flow? Is it gonna, so there's two parameters it coming. It knows. Out. It knows, that's right. Okay, so we're going to go look for that when we refresh the flow. I think, I, I, I think you should do one more thing before you rebuild the flow, if you go back to the dev console, you can do something like this after your, um, I'm gonna put it in the chat, okay? But Here's after your- I think you still have control, you can just- oh, okay. Hide. So. Hey, Lawrence, welcome. Because I think I think this will look better. Oops, I'm trying to copy from somewhere else. Ugh. You can do like this: label equals hybrid live coding. This is called XP GPT. Chicken is well cooked. I think the ranch dressing is perfect. Lawrence, are you meaning to be off mute? Okay. It's <laughs> watching Downton Abbey. <laughs> oh, I hope I did this right. That's what it looks like. Is it mad now? Okay. Well, variable. I mean, this is. Yeah, that's fine. Let me try and help with. Oh, there's no no comma. Yeah, no that's comma. Bizarre. That makes sense. Okay, sorry, it's it's like mega laggy, but. Oh, no. are you, okay. I'm trying to do something. Okay, well, let me fix what you got here. I okay. wanted to, to say, please tell me your secret. Yeah. Please tell me a secret about yourself. Well, we don't, I don't want to spend too much time on it because the next thing I want to do is take this variable instead of have it be random text. I want to put a variable there and then go get something else yes. off, based off of a query. So oh. we need to spend too much time making the, the um, interim stage funny. So here, let me uh, go ahead and refresh and let's see what the invocable action allows us to do. We'll go here. Two outputs. Give it an account. Pause this with me. 
All right, so we passed multiple things through the apex object into back to the flow with only a little bit of help from Nathan writing the whole thing, of course. <laughs> and from the crowd also participating. So our new friends from Tech Mahindra. And John Wiedenfaller is not here tonight. He registered, but I don't see him. And he is the CPQ, our resident CPQ uh, learner slash adept. So, all right, so we've got that. And so if I wanted to flow input, so. Are you trying to add a second parameter? I'm trying to just add a variable so that I can go query something and store it. I want to take this here. Following me? Well, do you want an input? Do you want a second input parameter? So you, you could you could uh, say- I don't want a second input parameter. I'm about to go query something to replace- Oh, uh, I got it. Paul is a Swifty. So I want to- Like, like the record ID. Add. I see what you're saying. So like query the record for the name. Yeah, I want to- Okay, that. I like that. So that's Paul is a Swifty. So we want to do- I think you should just declare it right there. Okay. Uh, will it not just, work? Just because, it? yeah, I think I think it will it will get mad because it's a static class. I mean, a static method, and then you have the you're declaring the string as a property, sort of. Well. Not really. So just. You just say straight, yeah, just do it there. Perfect. Because you don't, you don't really need it outside of that method anyway. Okay. So invalid type schema dot users. All right, so help me. Oh, uh, select name from account. Let's assume, what are you using, an opportunity? Colon so, record ID. Yeah, let's query something. So if we know it's not an opportunity, we know it's something else. Um, what I mean, it's gonna, gonna it's gonna get ugly because you're you're gonna deal with dynamic SQL. So, so if you wanna do this the easy way, I, would, I want to use I a would, session parameter of user, the current user's ID, but I know the name is already there. Uh, yeah, um, it's like user that get something dot get current user. All right. You're looking for user info and you, you don't need to query it. So string my var equals user info dot get first name. So here's my account. Let's, let's just hard code it, make this kind of work. Okay, so in theory, expecting colon found illegal assignment from list to string. So that should be limit one, right? Do I need to add? Uh, you can do bracket zero at the end. Where did chat go? Like just, no, not there. If I can still type, I'll 
I'll put it in, but it takes like 10 seconds. Okay. Oh, no, that's good. Never mind. Still doesn't like missing semicolon at my var. What am I missing? It's uh, the array brackets, I think go after string. I'm more of a list angle bracket string okay. person, but I don't, I think it goes to the left. From list to list. Oh, is it? Oh, a list of account. So, so, yeah. And then, and then you want my var zero dot name. Something like that. And then now it's not a string, it's an account in the constructor. Uh, no, it, it should just give it a second. Because you're passing in a string at this point. That's true. Yep. So okay. if you save it, it might stop being mad. Yep, you're right. No, that's the wrong screen. Let's give it the zero zero one. And there's the name of the account. Cool. We pulled something from a query, grabbed exactly what we want, and threw it directly into a flow. Easy peasy. All right, LJ, you got any good challenges for us to try and take on from here? No, sir, I'm just trying to keep up. Okay. Anybody, I'll put the code that we've got currently, I'll throw that into the chat. That may be too big of a something to paste into the chat. Make it an attachment. There's the bulk of it. Okay, here's the header. I'm doing this out of order, sorry. Oops. Run this through a formatter. Oh, it actually looks not so bad if you make your chat really, really wide. Yeah, just putting it in the wrong order. The BAC or the middle, then the front, and then the back. Yeah. Beautiful. Yes. If you if you if they're inside of the same class, that the method can call those other methods. If you need to call from flow, if you're calling this one method, I mean, 
You can have more than one method in the class, but only one invocable method that will show up and can be called from the flow inside of a class. So you can write some other functions in here, call them inside of the class. So we could sub these out and we can keep up with our PMD rules by having really small functions and we can call them in basically kind of like private, private methods and call them that way from the public method. Or if you want another invocable Apex action to show up that does something completely different, you would create a new class and have that one function show up as a new, like we have hello world, that's one class, one method that can be called, but multiple functions in the method. Is that what you're asking? Yep. Okay. And hi, I didn't meet you. You weren't here. Welcome. You, you have been here before, right? You have first time for, okay. And names, I'm Paul. Salita? Salita, okay. And? Pagev. Okay. Umar, Prashant, Kendall. Hi. Hi, Sai. Okay, great. Cool. Thanks, Nathan. That was neat. Do you know any other tricks? Of course. I was looking for things that were out in the wild. I was thinking about unofficial SF and how there must be components that are designed like purely in invocable apex. But I think I, I got to go with this example. I, I When I was searching, something came up where it, it seems like you could make an invocable method to post to Slack. So if you have a Slack channel that's relevant to a flow, you could, I really sound like I work for Salesforce, don't I? Um, but I, I think I think you could post to Slack, like that. That would be something cool that you could build. Although it might, it might be out of the box at this point. Um, yeah, this could be oh, external web service services. calls are out of the box. That's another one that we don't need the Apex for anymore. So the only thing, the only mm -hmm. the, the only other yeah, thing I wanted to try for this that I know if I'm going to do this, I can't use flow, is when you're doing a large map lookup, when you're trying to build an object based on the results from another query, and you're trying to do multiple, so you're dealing with a list as the output, and if you want to look up geolocation based off of a query outside of Salesforce and pull that in and have large sets of data related to each other where you're doing a lot of finds or a lot of Git based on a, a, rec, a, a key set, you can't really do that in flows. So if I were wanting to pass in a record and have it do the key set map, match up and give me back um, a new list of object, and I, I think, I don't know that, you, I don't think you'd have to do it as a wrapper class. I think you could brute force your way through it with regular, uh, a regular array and pass it back and show that as a result set into the flow. But that's the only real thing besides, I, I can do infinite records. Um, lock records is the only other thing I think you can only do in Apex. So if we had a record we wanted to lock for some reason, I don't even know why you would use that anymore. Um, but yeah, it's a, the record lock and then uh, large in memory intensive stuff like doing a git put um, map and building an object based off the results of a couple queries. There's not an easy way to do that without a lot of um, flows or loops within loops within loops, trying to get records for each set and then um, doing that each way. Little clumsy inside of flows. Paul, I'm going to send a link. What's that? I'm sending a link. So, so this is on unofficial SF, and I think okay. this is. This is a neat little article. It only has two examples. One is opposed to Slack, but um, it, it it's just like a brief overview of invocable actions. And you know, I think like sending SMS from Twilio is kind of a cool idea. You can, can install you see, from the. Can you see if the select distinct? So when we talked to Eric Smith, he said that select distinct was an unofficial SF action. 
And I wanna find that code and figure out how to copy and paste it into this. Okay. Uh, so that we can use that. And sorry, I've got another question here. It's a- Where flows cannot handle a huge set of list map and wanna do the comparison. That is like for any, any kind of a solution, that is something that we need to avoid. Like it's not just for the flow. Oh, okay, okay. I mean, like whatever you were saying, like you get the geolocation and you try to compare two large maps and you're trying to build it. Maybe that should be taken as a separate class by itself rather than you know doing it in the flow context. Of it. Well, in the, so I see it done a lot in triggers where you have old map and you're doing a lot of processes. So you assume you get in 45 records and you go and select from something else. Hey, I want to update the expiration date for all of these tasks, but I wanna do it based off of the data that's in this other table. So for every record that I get in the trigger, the, ma the map of the, the, you know, it could be 300 things that are created at the same time. So there's a, a, your trigger is handling 300 objects and, or 300 records, and you wanna go out and get the expiration date for all 300 of them. So you query, give me the expiration date for everything that's in trigger map, old map dot key set. And that would bring back 300 records. And then you loop over that, the, uh, the, the map and you get for whatever the ID is for the, get the expiration date. And you, people end up looping over that. And so they're creating a 300 record set. Uh, they're updating 300 records at the same time based on the results from whatever query included those. So that's where I see it. it's in bulk tree. It's in bulkification that I see that most of the time. As we get out of the trigger logic, somewhere in a batchable mode, you you run that as a separate scheduled task rather than bringing it to your trigger. Would, but don't you have to, if you're bulkifying a trigger, don't you have to do that for a lot of triggers? Because you have to assume that you're going to get more than one record, so you have to. You have, even though it's, I hey, just want the expiration date for anything that's processed, I've got to get all possible expiration dates and put them into the map of all the records that could have possibly been sent to me. You write, I, that's just the pattern I've seen. You may be talking uh, past what my experience is on writing those. So I may, maybe I'll be catching. That make any sense to you, Nathan? The nonsense that I'm talking? Hey, I wasn't listening. I, I I was looking up more examples, and I found I found where they are. Sorry. Okay. So yes, whatever you said was perfect. <laughs> so if you scroll down, I mean this this is interesting like individual flow but at the bottom i think that's more of what you were talking about where there is a list of actions provided that are um on records so like deduping records you know you you could you could build a record collection you could pass it into one of these actions and then they, they have things like sorting um joining it's an aggregate query is the one that I always want to do. I always want to group by account and be able to pull back uh, the an aggregate query result. I believe there's an advanced SQL. Uh, oh, here's SQL. Here's limit. So you can, uh, that would be helpful. There's definitely like a. Let's go look at this one. So being able to put limit into a query yeah. is kind of cool. So let's see if we can find that. Execute SOPL query is the one you're looking for. Okay, so since we've already done a query, let's, can we just put, we have param object API name and it's putting it in there. Well, I, and I think it, it's also really important to point out here, all of these have source. At yeah, least as that's far what as I, I wanted. Know. That's the main thing I wanted to get to. This unofficial SF has seemed like an amazing boundary of hacks and stuff that you, but you'd have to install them is what I thought. Um, and, you know, if we're working for a client, installing something from this place is not going to be okay, a package. But since they provide the source, you can go read the source, see how they did it and copy and paste it into your own solution 
So you're still using it. Uh, somebody's already done it. So there you go. I can send you the link. You can go right to the source this for execute SoQL. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. And here's your invocable method. Okay, so how did you find that source? Where was that? Oh, um, scroll down on the execute SoQL flow action. And, and you'll see all the versions. So on unofficial SF, okay, you'll see all the versions. So, on the, so, so click start on flow on the top, click flow at the top, then actions. Oh, I don't know. You just went right there. Okay. And then it's called execute SoQL. So scroll up to the ease. There are tons. Okay. Oh, installable flow actions. Execute. I, I think Yep. Okay. So we're on that page. I think there's lag between where I'm at and where you're, what you're yeah, saying. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. It's super, super laggy. Scroll down and you'll see like a bunch of versions and what the change log was and then source button. There we go. View source. Okay. And I'm in here at main default. I'm like 25 seconds behind you. What? And I'm not that far away. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, no, I've got, I'm on uh, GitHub. Okay, classes. But I'm way behind, remember that. Okay. Okay, classes, execute SQL.cls. And this All will right. look a lot like what you did, but. Yep. More Perfect. Complicated. Thank you, sir. So yeah, there is a bunch of source code that you can now leverage and put that into your flows. That's cool, that's some good power. And if you're smart, you'll write small methods that can be called and componentized. Don't do the big long class, but make small things that you can reuse like execute so suckle um, and make genericize them and build them and then get a good naming convention in your apex class files so that you can easily find these so if they're invocable components you can build a naming convention around that anybody have any questions from the the virtual community Play the stump Nathan game. Find something that Nathan That's doesn't easy. know and learn it. <laughs> That's easy. I think that was the nicest compliment somebody ever paid me. Like someday I'm gonna find out something that you don't know and learn that. <laughs> That's pretty nice. That was pretty nice. Right. I don't, that's, that's really what I wanted to accomplish. Um, it can be done with a query or a, so we've got a query and we've got apex functions. Paul, how many years ago was that? And have they ever found it? <laughs> it was after I fixed the time, the, the old school analog time clock at the drugstore that I worked at to make it look like the uh, the manager and main pharmacist hadn't shown up 20 minutes late and cost us all 20 minutes worth of uh, minimum wage time that we were all due outside waiting for him to unlock the door. So I took apart the time clock, set the time back, let us all clock in, <laughs> and then set time forward like nothing ever happened. Um, but no, yeah, I... There's lots of stuff I don't know. Nathan has to help me all the time if I get when I get in over my head on, on dev, which is early and often. You can call him directly on your cell phone on his cell phone for any numbers uh, for any questions on Apex. I 
Anyone else? Anybody got anything at all? I was muted and I said, that's not true. It's like once every two years that you ask a question. <laughs> Thanks, LJ. Underselling yourself. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, the, the, actually all of my knowledge has recently been deposited into that architecture book. So I, I submitted that off for final uh, printing, basically. And you know, <laughs> I, used, I used to ask an interview question, like rank yourself on how well you know something like .NET and five meant that you wrote the book. And people <laughs> would say five and yeah. they like really had to know it. Yeah. So I hope level. that happens to you. And then they argue with you. No, no, no. Five means you wrote the book on Salesforce <laughs> architecture. Yep. So I literally wrote the book on Salesforce architecture. <laughs> literally wrote the, the book. book. There's a couple. This is, and this, I, like I said, I, um, if anybody needs it, it's not something that'll be super useful to you if you already know Salesforce really well. I wrote this book to try and translate architecture concepts for classical. So if you've come from any other cloud or if you've come from an on-premises server stack, understanding what components of Salesforce like the event bus. Hey, that, okay, yeah, that's Kafka. If you've worked with Kafka, now you know what the event bus is and you know that there's a Kafka bus inside of Salesforce, but because they give it pretty names, you don't know it. That's one of my favorite examples and I'm just trying to unmask and demystify things. So um, it's not really telling you how to do architecture, it's describing what the components are so that if you know architecture principles and best practices, once you know what the elements are that you're working with, it should be easy to apply your own standards. So anyway, very excited. That has been all of my spare time is trying to dump that into a uh, single book. So uh, that's there. And hopefully a lot of people will join us in the Salesforce ecosystem uh, a lot more easily. That it took me months to figure out that an account was a business and not a username and password. Spent weeks trying to get my account reset and having them tell me, well, yeah, which company do you work for? I just told you my user ID, that's my account. Oh, your account, yeah. What company, are you? well, I work for 7-Eleven. Why, why do you need to know that? What's in an account? You said you have a problem with your account. I need, an account is not an account. Your account is oh. locked up, your username and password is bad. Yeah, Lawrence. Uh, put a link uh, to your book in the chat. What's that? Put a link to your book in the chat. No, I'm sorry, I still can't hear you. I'm behind the speaker, so all I get is bass. Put a link to your book in the chat. Oh, sure, sure. Thanks. Here I've got, yeah, the, I'm actually on Amazon. So nobody really needs to buy it. If you're here, you probably already know more than enough Salesforce to get by. But if you're wanting to understand other art, the, if you're wanting to hear that Kafka is something similar to the Invid bus and know that you need to be speaking in open source, heavy hitting tools, Hadoop, stuff like that. Uh, this should crack some of that open the other direction as well. Anyway, yeah, thanks for the, let me do the quick plug. Just very happy to have that done. Uh, if nobody else has any questions, uh, thank you very much, Nathan. I'm so glad you were here. In fact, I promised I'd work with you on this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I kept begging. Yeah, no, th this is such an easy one. There's so much power. We just flow keeps gaining powers and it makes it to where you had need less and less for with the uh, apex. So it's really cool. I don't remember why I had to make one of these, but I, I remember thinking this could be awesome. And, and I think those ideas from unofficial SF are, are really great place to start. All you need is to know what your goal is and you could do something really cool. 
Yeah, but going to a, the description of a problem to a GitHub repository that already has a solution and now being able to go take the code from that solution and put it into your, uh, into your solutions and reuse that code, that's, that's pretty powerful. And especially from Flow, to put that in the hands of a Flow developer and walk away. Hey, here you can do any Sockle. If you know Sockle, you know how to do aggregate queries, uh, put it in there and pull that into your flows. We don't have to, if that's the only thing that you couldn't do before to where you could have a full on flow based solution, you don't have to have one third, you know, 20 flows and 400 apex classes. You can do it in mostly flows and you don't need to go to apex except for some componentized, get this, get that. Um, it can be a lot easier. They still have to build some more structure. Like right now your classes, it's one big folder of all of your class code. If you don't have a good naming structure, just you're gonna be reinventing the wheel because it's really hard to find somebody, something that somebody's already built. There's no easy to put in namespace or organization structure um, you know, without hopping into packages and trying to package stuff together and getting that namespace. Uh, flows is they're adding some stuff. There's these are the triggered flows. This is organized by object on the trigger. Um, I think orchestration is doing a little bit of that, uh, but that will be a big deal um, for uh, for people to be able to go on and build more and more solutions on flows. All right. Huge logic, all this very big and a lot of logic. But all the context, all the context I have. So, how, what would be the best practice for me to move the flow? Do I, if I have some requirement that I can achieve with flow, will I even go for it? Because I already have a trigger. With the trigger, I can with that specific context, I can add two or three lines of code, and I can get rid of that. So. What would be the ideal recommendation in such cases? Um, that is an interesting question because flow has limits on the, the complexity. It has more strict limits on the CPU runtime for transaction uh, than triggers do I, still, if I'm still correct. They just took out the iteration limit. It used to be you could only go through certain, so many like 2000 iterations inside of a flow. Now it's just CPU time. Um, so if, the, if you've got too much logic that's being processed in the trigger, then you will probably also have too much logic processed in the flow. You might run into a little bit more tighter um, restrictions on the flow logic just because of the way it's built that it might take more time on the CPU than trigger, but it shouldn't be much. You can break the trigger apart into a couple of different flows with different conditions. So, and this is where it's getting, a, a, I'm gonna, nobody has any heavy objects or rocks here, right? Um, the one trigger per object rule means use a limited number of triggers, class files per object. One is not a special number. One just means be organized, have all of, it's kind of a namespace for, logic around an object. So the rule that everybody has kind of adopted is one trigger per object. You might translate that and have one flow per object. I never really like that because usually the update logic and the create logic, I like to have at least two flows per object. I have an on update flow and I have an on, on create flow for each object. And there you can put separate logic in it. So really, but it depends on how big um, you're going to have it to whether you want to have five or six flows with each entry condition different. And those entry conditions are supposed to be pretty fast. If you're getting really fancy with oh, with uh, previous and prior value and stuff like that, you might run into some hiccups trying to do, you might jump through a lot of hoops of making formulas and making variables that store formulas where it's easier just to write one clear line of code, you have to jump through those a lot more in flows. So the use case is getting a better to be able to do that if you do that from the beginning. If you're trying to just reverse, if you're trying to just take a big trigger that you already have and put it into flows, that would be harder because the paradigm set, you, 
you really have to rebuild everything from scratch. It's not going to be as quick of a, um, a movement just straight from code into flow. So one of the things I'm most proud of, I, I, I built a hack using flows that it uses recursion. You can actually get flows to recurse and if you use the event bus. So the transaction rule for how long a transaction can be for a flow, if you, if you have an event triggered flow that creates an event whenever it gets done with however much work it can get done and calls itself again and starts to complete the work again, the event ends the, the transaction. So each run of the flow, so if you've got 10 million records or 10,000 lines of uh, logic that you've got to process, if you can batch it into small sizes, you can use an event to continually call the same flow and have it process through the records or process through whatever job you're trying to do a piece at a time. Without having one single flow, you do the first step called by the original one, you event, emit an event, you create an event record that calls the second step. It gets its own transaction time. Whenever you think you run out of transaction time, you just stop the flow processing. So it's like calling subflows, except the subflows, subflow flows don't get a new transaction. Event triggered flows get a new transaction and you can keep running. So there is a way to do basically infinite records or infinite CPU time if you break it up and call it sequentially using events. Uh huh. So yeah, I've seen flows process 1.5 million records with one flow calling itself and doing them in batches of five or 600 at a time. You said that uh, the point there, go for a time So you you have to you have to data partition. You have to figure out how many records you can process and how many milliseconds, and then limit the number of records. If you've got each record takes, you know, eight seconds to process, then you do one record, you process it, you fire another event, you do the next record. If you mark that record as done, you don't come back to it, and then you query the records that haven't been done on that run. Just for the sequential process, synchronous processing that you're talking about. Yes. Let's say we are handling asynchronous processing. Okay. How will that be of, like, I mean, with this platform you use? Have you come across any such scenario where in flows, you try to handle some huge number of records, you're going asynchronous, but the asynchronous process fails because of, you know, multiple other transactions trying to do a record lock on top of it? Yes, that can, yeah, you, if, if you are trying, well, so in theory, if you're, if you're only processing one record at a time, the, if you're, if you're trying to do, the, you're doing them synchronously, if you're doing them asynchronously, you'd have a bunch of things trying to do something at the same time, but you're processing one at a time, and it's not, it doesn't complete until it's done, so it had, waits for that lock to be released, and then you do the next one. So you don't queue up a thousand at a time, you do them one at a time, all a, th a thousand of them one at a time. And so hopefully you don't break your synchronous. It, it can be done. You may have to re-slice your, your problem approach to be able to use that as a, as a function. I, it drove, I got driven to that because I built this really cool flow and the client misrepresented how many records it would have to process. Um, and so they told me it was, there were only, uh, 300 accounts that I needed to run every night. And so I built this cool flow that did a lot of records when it turned out there were actually 2000 accounts, but only three of 300 of them were their class A accounts. Um, I didn't have a way to pull the class A ones out. And so my flow broke trying to do all 2000. So I made a copy of it and I just ran it twice. And at the end I got done, but that's, 
okay, now, now there's, I have to run it again. If I put more logic in it, I had to make more copies. But the event bus just let me, I did, okay, 20. And 20 was how many I knew I could get done. So I stopped the looping and processing at 20 records. And then I called it, I put an event out and called it again and did another 20. If I had more logic in there, I would just do fewer and fewer records. You build that into the flow. I've got a whole set, I can check, I'll send you the, I'll post the link, you're not in the Zoom, but um, I'll, I'll, uh, I've got a QR code that I, will, I can, I'll pull up the link to the YouTube and I can show you the whole thing. But yeah, it's because it used to be on iterations, you had to divide iterations by the number of records you could do. And so if it could do 2000 iterations, but you had three steps, you divide 2000 by three and I can only do 600 records at a time. If I do, if I have four steps in the flow, I can only do uh, 500 and so on and so on. So whenever I got, when you get to like a thousand, you can only process one record or two or three. You set that limit while you're building the flow and you track kind of how many iterations you're going through and your loop, you could have put a loop counter in there and you say, break the loop and tell the, and save everything and then emit another event. If you actually hit, if the limit is 50 and there's only 40 records, well, there must be, you must be at the end. So it finishes and it doesn't call itself again. But I've got that whole pattern documented as session. Paul, you can put that uh, Zoom link in this chat for us. Sure. Yeah, I figured everybody was sick of me talking about that session. I'm very proud of of finding that hack and doing infinite records and Salesforce in flows. It's always impressive when you can do the impossible. Well, that can't be done, but I did it anyway. Mm -hmm. I kept thinking Salesforce was gonna come find me. Um, I put a disclaimer on there. It said, you don't know me. If you break your org and you do an infinite recursion, forget my name. My name is Nathan Shulman. Are you presenting at Dreamforce this year? I am not. I missed the deadline. I had a pretty good session that I wanted to do, but um, I didn't come up for air. Uh, in time to uh, to get a, a session in. Yeah, I think the selection was tough. I didn't get selected. Uh, uh, who else? Uh, I can't think of his guy's name right now. But none of us got selected from our group that I'm aware of. Well, this is, uh, you know, kind of the If you got it, or I don't know if you got it from the Zoom, but I'm oh, sorry, hold on, that's going to the, let me get the time code out of there. That was the biggest limiter on flows. And with this pattern, whatever was your cute, whatever started your flow, you just have that create an event that starts your flow. Uh, so every night at midnight, I would create, I'd have a schedule, run a flow that created an event. That, and then I had another flow that was triggered by that event. 
that started doing the processing and would loop over itself and would just keep doing it. So if it's a, if it's a trigger, the trigger creates the vent that calls the flow and the flow calls itself until it's done. And you just put the criteria in there. Cool. Thanks for the questions, Lawrence. Anybody have anything else before we close off for the night? All right, if not, thank you everybody for coming. I uh, really appreciate it. And hopefully next month we'll have something, I think Stefan Chandler Garcia is gonna be able to, uh, he's a lead architect evangelist for Salesforce. And he'll be talking to us about uh, Einstein GPT again. So now that they've got more details and they're allowed to talk about it, it should be a really good session. All right, thanks everybody.